Well, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, my name's Simon and I'm a psychiatrist and a researcher. Um, I've been at Basic Kings for years, but I've actually just started working for the University of Melbourne, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that later on. Um, and I've been doing research into ayahuasca, based in retreat centres in the Amazon rainforest for the last seven years. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit like about that. So we're going to first start off by exploring what ayahuasca actually is before discussing the set and setting of the research in the Amazon rainforest. I then want to mention ayahuasca tourism. Um, ayahuasca has become incredibly popular over the last 10 to 20 years and I think it's really important that we speak about that. And now I'm going to introduce the first study that we did looking at ayahuasca and its effects on personality um, before moving on to the phenomenology and pharmacology of ayahuasca. Then we're going to speak about the effects of ayahuasca on mental health and epigenetics, which is um, the way that genes are expressed. And then we're going to discuss ayahuasca and nature connectedness, and that's people's connection to nature, how they relate to nature. And then we're going to move on to talk about ayahuasca randomised control trials. Um, so this is what we're up to in Melbourne, and this is opening the possibility of the medicalisation of something inspired by ayahuasca. And we're going to talk about the ethics of doing that and whether or not we should be going down that path and what it might look like. So why do we need to research ayahuasca or psychedelics in general? So many people today say that we're actually in the middle of a mental health crisis. Over 300 million people suffer from mental health problems around the world. And to put that into context, that's roughly the population of the United States of America and 5% of adults worldwide. One third of people that are prescribed antidepressants don't respond to them. And NICE, which is the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, recommends cognitive behaviour therapy as first-line psychotherapy, but 50% of people don't respond to that either. Research into new ways of treating mental health problems has slowed since the turn of the millennium, and many of the new treatments that we do have lack innovation and are just reformulations of pre-existing treatments. So basically, we desperately need something new. So how did I get into this? Um, so about seven years ago, or eight years ago now, I've been working in the NHS as a doctor for a few years, and I was beginning to get a bit dismayed when I was working in psychiatry. Um, particularly, I was getting a bit fed up with the way that we treat our patients, um, specifically the drug treatments. So I found that many of the patients that we treat just came back time and time again. And this happened so much that we even have a term for it. We call it the revolving door syndrome. And so I decided to have a break from medicine and I traveled to Central and South America. And when I was in Guatemala, I was sitting in a cafe next to somebody who was training to be a shaman. And I started speaking to them about the work that they were doing. And they told me that they were working with something called ayahuasca and that they were treating many of the conditions that I've been struggling to treat in the hospitals back home. So I was completely blown away by the stories that he was telling me. And so when he invited me to come with him to Peru to see what he was up to, I said yes. So I had my first experience with ayahuasca then, and it was uh, really profound for me and the people that I was on the retreat with. And so I excitedly started looking into the research that had been done in ayahuasca, seeing if there was a gap in the literature. And I found that some people had been researching ayahuasca, but this was mainly in ayahuasca churches in Brazil um, and in Peru. And this is when you combine Christianity with ayahuasca. But there was relatively little, actually pretty much none, um, looking scientifically at the use of ayahuasca in retreat centres. Um, at least at that time, it's changed a bit now. Um, and so I tried to get some funding to start doing research into this area and unsurprisingly didn't manage to get any and no one wanted to fund it. So I actually self-funded our first study looking at ayahuasca and personality. Unfortunately, that opened the floodgates and we've got more and more money to continue doing the research um, that I'm going to tell you about today. So what actually is ayahuasca? Now this is actually a surprisingly difficult question to answer because ayahuasca is many different things to many different people. But very simply put from a reductionist scientific point of view, ayahuasca is a Amazonian psychedelic brew that's made of the Banisteriopsis capi ayahuasca vine and this contains the beta carbolines or homala alkaloids. 
And it's mixed with a plant that contains DMT. Usually, this is the Psychotria viridis or Chacruna leaves, um, but it can be a whole host of other things. And when you orally ingest DMT, it's normally broken down by enzymes in the stomach, but when you mix it with the ayahuasca vine, the Hamala alkaloids in the vine prevent that breakdown, and you get, um, DMT gets absorbed into the bloodstream, and it makes its way to the brain, and you get the psychedelic effects associated with ayahuasca. Ayahuasca very loosely translates to the vine or the rope of the dead or the souls. And when people drink it, they describe profound changes in their sensory perception. They can have changes in their cognition and their thinking and emotion. Ayahuasca quite famously makes you purge, but this isn't just the vomiting that most people think of. There can also be diarrhea or there can be shaking, sweating, or even purging emotion. The purge can come in many different ways. Lots of people see or hear things that other people can't see or hear, and other people go within themselves into a state of introspection. And for many, they believe that you can actually connect with the divine. Ayahuasca has been used as a tool for medicine and as a sacrament. It's been used for uh, scientific inquiry and spiritual development. In the past, it was used a lot more for warfare and for hunting, but less so now. And more recently, it's become an interest for people who are trying to do a pilgrimage or ayahuasca tourism. So, how does ayahuasca actually work? Ayahuasca has effects psychologically, so it can increase mindfulness and it can also increase decentering. And it can also increase cognitive flexibility, so this is the ability to adapt to different situations. Neurobiologically, it decreases activity in the default mode network, which is an area of three connector hubs that are overstimulated and overactive um, in rumination, and that leads to things like depression and anxiety. It increases neuroplasticity, which is the ability of the brain to form new connections, for the neurons to form new connections. It affects serotonin receptors, like many of the antidepressants we already have, um, and other psychedelics. And it activates parts of the brain like the amygdala, which are involved in emotional processing. It also activates the sigma-1 receptor, which can, is hypothesized to be involved in memory storage. But that's just one way of thinking about it. I think it's quite easy to come in here as doctors and scientists and to just say, well, the indigenous people use ayahuasca um, and they think it works like this, but actually we know better and we know it works like this. So I just want to highlight um, from an indigenous point of view, at least the Shipibo um, tribe, who are the people that we work with, that they have a different idea on how it works. And I don't think they would necessarily agree with what we just covered, but I think they would say you're kind of missing the point here. What they believe <clears throat> is that in ayahuasca ceremonies, it's the plant spirits that actually do the healing. They sing ikaros, they chant these medicine songs to communicate with these plant spirits, and then they ask the plant spirits to heal the participants in the ceremony. They form allies with these spirits in other dimensions through things called plant dietas, which is where they consume small amounts um, of what they believe to be enlightened trees um, in order to get messages and get teachings from these trees. And all of their beliefs are based around animism, which is that everything has a spirit. That plants have a spirit, animals have a spirit, a river and a rock has a spirit. And this can be quite hard to grasp from a Western point of view. There are, however, parts of the Shibibo tradition that link in quite nicely with Western um, points of view. So, for example, we're going to cover some of the research that I've been doing looking at genetics and the way that ayahuasca affects epigenetics, which is whether or not genes are turned on or turned off. And you find in epigenetics that when genes are turned on, if people are traumatized, so for example in the Holocaust, these get passed down through generations. And when I was just speaking to the Shipibos about our research into epigenetics to see if ayahuasca could almost reset the way that the genes were expressed, they immediately said, oh, you mean cleaning familial lines, cleaning ancestral lines. So there are some things that overlap with the Western scientific point of view. Okay. So all of our research is based in the Mashana National Reserve um, in the Peruvian Amazon. This is a small community of about 80 indigenous individuals. There's no mains electricity or phone signal, and it's two hours away from the nearest town, which is the city of Iquitos.
We work with highly qualified uh, indigenous healers such as Don Rono here. Um, and the name of the research center is Riosbo and it's affiliated with MAPS, the most disciplinary association of psychedelic studies. So here we can see it's right in the heart of the Peruvian Amazon. And this is the Mashana community. And this is Riosbo, the research center that we're based at. <coughs> so before participants engage in their ayahuasca retreat, they need to prepare the body and the mind. And this involves a washout period, so two weeks before drinking ayahuasca, where people have dietary restrictions, so they're avo avoiding things like dairy, fermented cheeses, fortified wines, and this is to um, try and reduce the risk of a hypertensive crisis if you have too much tyramine. They have to come off medications such as antidepressants, and this is to reduce the risk of serotonin syndrome, where you get very high levels of serotonin um, and it can be fatal. There are also behavioural restrictions, so you need to avoid engaging in sexual activity, um, you need to uh, avoid things like horror movies, any kind of negative, uh, things with negative association, and if possible, try and prepare the mind with a, um, a mindfulness practice. Participants are advised to have intentions for the ceremonies, and it's also important to manage expectations. So Ayahuasca has a bit of a reputation now um, in the media. You have people like Lindsay Lohan saying that it changed their life. And so people are expecting this huge experience, which sometimes does happen, and for many people that does happen, but it's also relatively common that that doesn't happen, um, at least not at first. And so people need to be aware that that can happen. So the ayahuasca ceremonies take place in a wooden structure thought to be sacred by the Shipibo community called a maloka. There's normally about 10 people, 10 participants, sitting around the outside of the structure and each of them have a bucket for the purge. The ceremony takes place at night and it lasts for around six hours in the pitch black. And there's lots of use of tobacco. It's a special jungle tobacco called mapacho. And it's believed that that helps to protect people, amongst other things. Everyone, including the shaman, and also called a curandero, drinks the ayahuasca brew. And then they chant medicine songs called ikaros throughout the whole of the six hours, throughout the whole of the ceremony. And they believe that this is what's causing the healing. After the ceremonies, the process of integration starts. And so there'll be a sharing circle immediately afterwards in the, the morning after, and the people are encouraged to discuss their experiences with peers and also with facilitators. It's then advised that participants engage in regular integration sessions after the retreat. So either with a, a psychotherapist that has expertise in ayahuasca or not, it doesn't really matter. Um, and ideally for about an hour a week for as long as they feel necessary. So before we go any further, I just want to talk a little bit about ayahuasca tourism. So as we've said, ayahuasca has turned into a booming business over the last 10 to 20 years, with thousands flocking to the Amazon rainforest and ayahuasca also spreading um, to every continent in the world. Many believe that this might be a diluting tradition. So it creates a demand for ayahuasca, but it creates a demand for the Western perception of what ayahuasca is. So many people feel that ayahuasca is just about love, light and healing, which is certainly a huge part of it. But like we've spoken about before, there's also things like witchcraft and warfare associated with the tradition. The fact that Westerners only want to engage in the healing and the love and light means that many of the shamans are only focusing on that area because it's good for business and it's changing, it's upsetting the balance of the tradition of ayahuasca. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? I mean, I'll leave that up to you. Um, but it is, it is changing the tradition. There are also concerns about the environment. And this isn't just to do with people flying to the jungle, but also to do with the sustainable harvesting of ayahuasca. There are, there are safety concerns. So 
unlike medicine in the West, um, there are many charlatans who just say they're a shaman. And for many people, they don't know who's a, who's a true shaman, who's not a true shaman. And this can lead to using plants that aren't safe and that aren't included in the ayahuasca brew. Um, plants like toe or datura, which can have a really high level of inducing psychosis. So that can lead to psychological or physical harm. There can be sexual exploitation. And unfortunately, it's no longer rare to hear of sexual exploitation. And this has become such a problem that there are now guidelines for the awareness of sexual abuse in ayahuasca ceremonies produced by shakruna.net. There's also an ethical code of how ayahuasca ceremonies should be run uh, on plan to forma. And I encourage anyone who's thinking about drinking ayahuasca uh, to check out both of these websites. Some people feel that ayahuasca tourism could be running the risk of making, uh, of commodifying ayahuasca. Could this be a case of cultural appropriation or biopiracy? Could it be neo-colonialism, where there's a market controlled by non-locals, and so the non-locals are disadvantaging the locals? When there's large amounts of US dollars coming into these small communities in the Amazon rainforest, it might sound like a good thing, but it can actually destabilize the community. But despite this, for many, ayahuasca tourism leads to healing, meaning, and community. And if done correctly, many have even argued that this may promote or protect tradition. Okay, so moving on to our first study looking at the effects of ayahuasca on personality. So this was an observational repeated measures design. So we gave participants inventories immediately before their ayahuasca retreat and immediately afterwards, as well as six months later to look for longer term effects. The retreats lasted for 12 days and participants drank ayahuasca every other day. And we also collected semi-structured interviews during the retreats to try and give a more holistic idea um, of what was happening during their ceremonies. We had a sample of 24 participants, nine of which were female, and these were primarily from a Western background. They were vetted by the retreat centre, the Ayahuasca Foundation. Twelve had historical or current mental health conditions, 14 physical health conditions, six had never tried any psychedelic before, 18 had, and eight of those had experience with ayahuasca. We also had a comparison group who weren't drinking ayahuasca. So these are people who were traveling around South America, just backpacking, but not drinking the brew. And we, we, the reason we did this is to control for something that we've termed the Mallorca effect, which is the idea that even traveling to South America and you know, just doing your thing um, and not drinking ayahuasca might lead to changes in personality. So we use the NeoPI to measure personality, which is the gold standard um, for testing personality. And this measures it in five different domains. Openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, which is together known as the big five or ocean. We also assessed people um, for a mystical experience, which is a, a peak experience, so whether or not they felt connected to God, whether they felt outside of time, they felt a sense of oceanic boundlessness. And we found that there were significant decreases in how neurotic participants were, both after the retreat, immediately, um, and this was maintained six months later when, when compared to the control group. And we also found that there were significant in increases in how agreeable participants were, both immediately after the retreat and then six months later when compared to the control group. In keeping with previous psychedelic research, we found that when participants had a, well, reported a greater level of mystical or peak experience, they had greater decreases um, in their levels of neuroticism. So the more that people thought that they were in contact with God, um, for example, the greater the decrease in how neurotic they were. So there are a few limitations from doing these kind of studies that I just want to point out. So we have limited access to equipment when we're working in the Amazon rainforest. 
There's also no set doses of ayahuasca. So normally in research, you would have a very uh, specific dose um, that you're looking at. Um, but when you're working in the jungle with ceremonial ayahuasca, the dose is actually up to the shaman's intuition and the participant's willingness on the day. Um, and to control that with a set dose, I think would have taken away from the naturalistic design of the research. Unfortunately, we're unable to analyse the ayahuasca samples um, in this study, so we don't know the exact levels of DMT and MRIs. And there's a clear self-selection bias. So it takes a certain kind of person uh, to go to the Amazon rainforest. And there are also lots of barriers to getting there. So, like, so money, getting time off work, all of these kinds of things. The sample size is also relatively small, with 24 participants, and so we need to be careful when generalising results. So from the same uh, study population, we started to look at the phenomenology of subjective experiences to get a more holistic idea of what was happening during the ayahuasca ceremonies. So we collected nine interviews and we performed a qualitative content analysis. So this is a, uh, a data-driven strategy and we had no hypothesis. We we're just doing this to see which themes arrive, um, arise from, uh, from the data that we collected. So we literally transcribed these nine interviews. Um, we cut them into separate phrases, which are called the coding units. And then we paraphrased all the ones that were similar. And then we paraphrased all of them today, uh, all of them again, and kept paraphrasing until we came up with categories subcategories, um, et cetera, et cetera. And we found there was one overarching topic and called experiences during the ceremony, and then two subtopics, which is preparedness and appraisal of the process. Preparedness largely um, was talking about motivation uh, for engaging in the ayahuasca ceremonies and also people's level of knowledge before the retreats. Appraisal of the process um, included difficulties during the process and also the role of the shamanic singing, how it changed people's visions, how it changed the physical effects that they experienced and also how it changed their mood um, and the energy that they felt. <coughs> Experiences during the ceremony um, had nine subtopics, and I'm going to take us through each of these quickly. So all of the participants highlighted the physical experience. The majority of them spoke about vomiting, and interestingly, this was associated with changing their visions, changing their thoughts, and changing their level of agitation. So it seemed to be doing something. Nausea was also commonly reported, and there were also other physical experiences such as stomach pain, diarrhea, raised temperature, exhaustion, and heaviness. The majority of participants spoke about either visions or hallucinations. Most of these were abstract visions, but there were some people who saw fantastic or weird creatures, and others saw scenes and people. Interestingly, these weren't true hallucinations, so it wasn't open-eyed um, visuals. Most of them were with closed eyes or in the darkness. So here we have a, uh, a quote here from one of the participants. I'm going to let you read um, about their experience seeing visions. In terms of attribution of meaning, most of the participants found that their experience was spontaneously meaningful. So they were immediately able to understand what had happened and have personal reflections on this. So for example, for me to kind of resolve that just to move on with my life, just to never have to think about that again, and to start, you know, a better relationship with someone else. For three out of the nine participants, they were unable to understand the content, <clears throat> and one of them was able to recognize symbolism. And then suddenly it occurred to me that this is just a symbol for my inner child. <clears throat> In terms of received messages, three out of the nine participants described communication with entities. So this is either communication with Mother Ayahuasca, messages from a family member, or messages from an unspecified entity. And the nature of the communication uh, was described as either in a teaching or a, an explaining style. Um, 
suggestion or given in a supportive and a calming manner. And suddenly I heard the voice of my mum and she says, you don't have to find anything, I'm always here, I'm always here. You just have to turn to me, towards me, and I am here anyhow because I am your mum. My love is always here. You are the one who turned away, you are the one who decided to go away. The moment you turn around, I am always here. Most people had insightful personal meaning um, as a result of their ceremonies. They described interpersonal psychological insights, insights into relational and social biographical themes, insights into the motives or in issues of other people, general social and ethical insights such as the healing of mankind or environmental wisdom, and others described mystical, spiritual and religious experiences. And then I started asking questions, questions that I think most people think about, like why is there life on earth and what happens when you die? Questions you can never normally have the answer to. And I felt those questions were just answered immediately. The answers were kind of implanted into my brain and I remember just lying on my mat thinking, how can this possibly be? So, most of the participants we spoke to about reactions, the reactions that they had, described acting outside of visions. So for example, they would repeat words to themselves in some kind of a monologue, or they would try to relax either by holding back vomit or changing their position. Some people described being attentive to other participants, but two out of the nine participants described acting inside visions, so communicating with their vision. So for example, I saw a little kind of joker being, and I asked him, as I was told to, if it was medicine. To stay if it was, and to go if it was not medicine. And then I was transported into a really brightly coloured scene. Cognitive reactions were further split into a number of categories such as doubts and worrying thoughts, controlling and rejecting content, intensifies thoughts, getting absorbed by the experiences and inordinate thought processes. When we came to look at emotional reactions, we found that the majority of participants had what we deemed therapeutically desirable emotions. All of them had unpleasant emotions, and four had what we called hedonistic emotions. So this was basically just having a really good time. The therapeutically desirable emotions were split into love and connection, calmness and relaxation, gratitude, acceptance and openness to others, and supported, nourished, well understood, and feeling self-confident. We've got a quote here illustrating that. So in terms of unpleasant emotions, eight out of the nine participants described feeling anxious. Three out of the nine described nervousness and three out of nine loss of control. But all of the participants described having at least one unpleasant emotion. Interestingly, eight out of the nine participants had an unpleasant emotion immediately followed by a therapeutically desirable emotion. And so this has led us to speculate that maybe there's a relationship between the psychotherapeutic target and the unpleasant emotions. Could it be that ayahuasca engages the participant in some kind of translational uh, emotional state where they have to basically go through this tough period before they can um, feel better and receive healing afterwards? Could that be a psychodynamic process which is leading to the resolution of emotional conflicts? But I think it's also important with this study, especially when thinking about communication with entities, that setting an expectation could have a massive influence um, on people's personal experiences. Okay. So following this, we conducted a systematic review to look at the pharmacology of ayahuasca to see how it was actually working on a neurobiological level. I'm only going to quickly touch on this, but we reviewed uh, three scientific databases and we found over 2,000 papers focused on the pharmacology of DMT or the Hamala alkaloids. 
Um, after doing an initial screening, 200 seemed appropriate. And then after doing a full screening, we found that 16 of those were relevant for review. So the main findings from the systematic review was that when you ingest DMT orally, it's not active if you don't have the Hamala alkaloids because it's getting broken down. If you give the Hamala alkaloids with DMT, this prevents the deamination, which is the removal of an amine group, and so you get the psychedelic effects of DMT. And there's also evidence that shows that DMT is affecting serotonin receptors, much like the other psychedelics and antidepressants, or at least some of them, the SSRIs. Interestingly, the Hamala alkaloids found in the ayahuasca vine also bind to the serotonin receptors. Harmine, the main um, Hamala alkaloid uh, found in the ayahuasca brew, increases brain-derived neurotropic factor in rats, and that has an antidepressant effect. Tetrahydrohamine, which is another one of the Hamala alkaloids, um, is actually a weak SSRI, so that's the same uh, class of drug as Prozac. And interestingly, there was one study that showed that when people drink ayahuasca, it increases the serotonin receptors on platelets, suggesting that that might actually increase the amount of serotonin receptors in the brain. Um, and that doesn't happen when you drink just DMT or you have just DMT. So it's suggesting some kind of synergistic relationship. Harmine was found to cause neurogenesis, which is the growth and the development of new neurons um, within the uh, nervous tissue in adult mice. And it was also, and ayahuasca was also found to activate frontal and paralimbic regions in the brain, which are involved in introspection and emotional processing. The default mode network, so the area of three connector hubs that we spoke about before, which is involved in rumination um, and just when you're daydreaming, um, was found to decrease in activity after drinking ayahuasca, but other areas increased in activity. So for example, the anterior cingulate cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex. So it had previously been assumed that the relationship between the DMT and the Hamala alkaloids was additive, but after doing this systematic review, it seems like there could be more complex synergistic mechanisms uh, taking place and further research is needed. Okay. So now we're going to talk about um, the our study that we did a couple of years ago, or last year actually, in 2021. Um, and this was looking at the effects of ayahuasca retreat centers on mental health outcomes and epigenetics. And this was actually the first ever study to look at any psychedelic and its effect um, on epigenetics. So in this study, we had 65 participants and we collected both quantitative and qualitative data again to get a more holistic idea of what was going on. And we used a similar methodology. So it's an observational design um, and we gave participants inventories immediately before their ayahuasca retreat, immediately afterwards and six months later to look for longer term effects. After collecting demographic information, we looked at the level of childhood trauma that participants had undergone to see if that was associated with any of the changes that we saw in mental health outcomes. After the experience, we gave people the mystical experience questionnaire. Um, and again, this was to see whether or not there was any relationship with the peak experience and mental health outcomes. And then before, after, and six months later, we tested participants for depression, anxiety, uh, self-compassion, um, general well-being, and also um, memory to see whether their memory and their perception of memories changed as a result of drinking ayahuasca. We got participants to provide saliva samples, um, so spitting in tubes immediately before and after the retreat, and that was so that we could test um, the epigenetic change. So epigenetics is a field of study that looks at the expression of different genes. Um, so the idea is, is that everything are in our environment changes the way that we express genes. Some things crank them up, other things crank them down. Um, and traumatic experiences, for example, might lead to um, certain genes being turned on more than they would be or being turned off more than they would be. And we wanted to see whether or not ayahuasca had any effect on that and potentially could be resetting some things, uh, some of the genes associated with trauma. So we found that there were significant decreases in how depressed participants were immediately following their ayahuasca retreat and also six months later. 
There was also significant decreases in how anxious participants were, again, in the short term and the long term. We found that participants had increases in their levels of self-compassion, again, maintained at six months, and decreases in their levels of global distress, both in the short and the long term. We also found that participants' perception of negative events or memories changed. So participants had a less negative perception of bad things that happened to them. So the actual memory didn't change, but the way that they thought about it had changed. We found that those who had a greater degree of childhood trauma had a greater decrease in depression. And we used depression as a proxy for all of the other mental health outcomes um, because they all followed a similar trajectory. And we also found, in keeping with previous psychedelic research, that the greater the mystical experience, the greater the decrease in depression. In our epigenetic analysis, we found that there was a change in expression of one of the genes that we looked at, the sigma-1 gene. Now this was a, um, an exciting finding because we found that it actually increased in methylation. So there were more methyl groups added onto it, which actually usually downregulates um, the, uh, the expression of that gene. And there's a hypothesis that the sigma-1 might be involved in traumatic memory recall. So it was, um, so it was an interesting finding, but we need to be careful with drawing uh, reliable conclusions from this because we only had 65 participants um, and we really need hundreds before we can draw any solid conclusions. But fortunately, we've got some more funding now um, so we're going to be looking at that uh, very shortly. So we concluded from this study that there were significant improvements in mental health outcomes um, and also wellness as a result of attending ayahuasca retreats both in the short term and the long term. This suggests lasting therapeutic potential for the ayahuasca retreats. And the epigenetic analysis suggests that sigma-1 could be one of these mechanisms of change and that ayahuasca might actually be affecting people uh, on the genetic level. Um, but further research is needed. Okay. So most recently, <clears throat> we've been looking at the effects of ayahuasca and nature relatedness. So this is the connection that people feel to nature as a result of attending ayahuasca retreats. In this sample, we had 58 participants and we collected just quantitative data immediately before and after the ayahuasca retreats. And we were assessing people on their level of nature relatedness, so their connection to nature, as well as depression, anxiety, mystical experiences, and also mindfulness. We found that people's levels of depression decreased as it did before in our previous study. But we also split anxiety into two different um, categories here. So we had trait anxiety and state anxiety. Trait anxiety is much more stable. It's a little bit thinking of thinking like of the climate of a place, whereas state is a lot more transient. So it's a bit like thinking of the weather. And we found that both state and trait anxiety decreased as a result of drinking ayahuasca. Mindfulness increased um, as a result of the ayahuasca retreat and also levels of people's connection to nature, their nature relatedness increased as well. We found that the greater, we found that increases in nature relatedness were associated with decreases in depression and state and trait anxiety. But interestingly, the mystical experience wasn't associated with any change in the mental health outcomes that we were looking at. And this is, kind of goes against previous psychedelic research that shows mystical experience is really important. This could have been because of the way that we were using the mystical experience questionnaire. We were using it to assess the whole retreat rather than just one, a one-off um, psychedelic experience. But it's interesting nonetheless. We also found that there was no relationship between the number of ceremonies that people had attended and mental health outcomes. And this is in keeping with previous research that seems to suggest it doesn't actually matter how many times you drink ayahuasca when you go on one of these retreats. All that matters is that you kind of drink it enough um, and you'll get these, you'll get these changes, um, which is a really interesting finding, but I don't think the retreat center liked it very much when we published that. Um, and also there was a trend towards the number of days spent in the Amazon on the retreat having an association with a decrease in mental health outcomes. So that suggests that 
It could be more important to be involved in the shamanic tradition and in the biodiverse um, environment of the Amazon um, in terms of helping your mental health than actually drinking ayahuasca. Um, so yeah, lots of, lots of interesting questions uh, that arose out of this study. And so we conclude that perhaps nature relatedness could have clinical application. This is something that obviously is completely free because nature is everywhere. You can just go and engage in it. Um, and it's something that's been really underutilized today. And God knows it's really important. It's the state of the environment at the moment. Okay. So I think when we're doing this kind of research, or when we're even talking about this research, we need to keep checking ourselves and asking the question, is ayahuasca research ethical? So just a few thoughts that I've been having. I think that data is certainly required. We've spoken about before the, the anecdotal claims in the media of all these celebrities going off and having these amazing experiences. But then also, if you type in ayahuasca, you immediately get all these results, like this 19-year-old guy who died in an ayahuasca ceremony. Um, so I think that we need to collect this data in order to see what's really going on there, so we don't just have these sensationalist accounts. There's been a stagnation in treatments, like we previously discussed, um, so we need to get some kind of inspiration for ways that we can treat mental health problems. I just want to mention reciprocity as well. So this is giving back to the people that we're working with. So <clears throat> there are a number of uh, really great organizations um, that run this, and I'm going to shamelessly plug uh, Danny's organization, Rain, who is actually who we support, uh, which is an agroforestry um, organization. Um, so with the research, who's benefiting from that? I mean, it's, it's quite nice, you know, I don't get paid for doing the research in the jungle, um, but I get to stand up and give these talks, it's good for my career, you know, it's definitely, it's definitely good for me in other ways. So we need to think about giving back to these communities. Right. And now I want to introduce potential medicalization um, of ayahuasca. <clears throat> So last year, I started working for an organization called the Psyche Institute. Um, and this is a not-for-profit research center um, that's actually based at the University of Melbourne, which is why I'm moving out there. Um, and it aims to develop psychedelic therapies as registered medical treatments. And this is going to involve doing scientific studies in the lab into ayahuasca. So we're going to make standardized versions of ayahuasca. So that's literally cooking up vast quantities of ayahuasca, sucking out all of the water in a process called freeze drying, putting this powdered ayahuasca into capsules so that we have a standardized version of the brew. And this opens up the potential for ayahuasca to be prescribed by medical doctors in the future. So a little bit about the study design. I can't really say too much about it at the moment um, because we're still designing it. Um, but it's going to be very heavy on preparation and integration sessions. So these are one hour sessions every week um, with a psychotherapist. Um, and it's going to be based on internal family systems, which is a psychotherapeutic modality that's based on multiplicity of the mind. There's going to be multiple dosing sessions. <coughs> And we're going to also have a heavy focus on the somatic, so bodily experience, because uh, that's such a big part uh, of the ayahuasca experience. And we're also going to run integration circles, so trying to build a sense of community. Um, so I think this is something that's been lacking in research to date. Um, and that's a huge part um, of ayahuasca, um, is the community that comes with drinking the brew. So the therapeutic approach is going to be very similar to other psychedelic studies. It's going to be a non-directive uh, way of doing things, supporting the experience that comes up for the participant. There's always going to be a dyad, um, so two therapists. Um, at least one of them will be female. Um, unfortunately, there's been, uh, again, sexual misconduct in these clinical trials as well, so we have to be very careful of that. And the patient will be reclining with headphones, um, listening to a specially designed um, playlist, which we've uh, made in conjunction with shamans. And they're going to be alternating between inner focus and speaking to the therapist, but they're really going to be encouraged to be going into themselves and they can talk about what comes up in the sessions following. And even though we're running this in a hospital, um, we're going to be trying to make it as homely as possible, um, do the best we can, given the fact it needs to be based in a medical setting.
So obviously this raises a whole host of ethical considerations. Is this just a case of cultural or spiritual appropriation? Is it that the West have gone through an existential crisis? Now we've taken the land and the resources of indigenous populations. Are we now aiming for the immaterial? There are definitely issues to do with oversimplification, trying to fit this ancient tradition into a Western medical framework. And I find that we lose a lot. And to be honest, when I stand up and I give talks like this to you guys and I have graphs that shows the depression goes down, I mean, that is what happens, but like that is a fraction of what happened. Um, I think that's something we need to be really aware of as well. And will it actually work? Now, this point is really interesting because from a Western perspective, ayahuasca works by affecting receptors in the brain, like we've discussed, like the serotonin receptors. But for the indigenous communities, it's the ceremony that's important and it's the spirit that causes the healing. And if you don't have that, then what do you have? Well, I mean, it's just a bunch of chemicals, really, like everything else we have. Is it actually ayahuasca? Now, I would actually argue no. Um, for me, I think ayahuasca is so much more than just the brew, than just the chemicals. Ayahuasca, one of the reasons that makes it so interesting and so beautiful is that ayahuasca is the ceremony, it's the tradition, it's the Icaros, it's the Amazon rainforest, it's the shaman, or whatever, whatever tradition you follow. And so what I think we actually have here um, is something that takes inspiration from ayahuasca. In fact, we're not even going to call it ayahuasca. We're going to call it DMT harmaloy concoctions. It's not very catchy, but it's a bit of a description of what we're actually using. And that also opens up the possibility to use other plants that aren't the traditional ayahuasca plants. So we can use other sources of DMT. We can use other sources of Hamada alkaloids. Because it's in a lab, we can tinker with the different levels. Um, so maybe ayahuasca will give us some kind of an inspiration um, of a new way of treating mental health conditions. So a few final thoughts. I think whether you agree with it or not, ayahuasca is spreading. It's now spread all around the world and it's in every single continent. So I think the questions that we need to be asking is how do we make that spread ethical? I believe that this is possible if we work together with indigenous communities. If we give back to and support those whose knowledge we work with, rather than just extracting like we have done so many times in the past. Can we respect tradition whilst allowing for adaptation in a safe and effective way? And can we listen to the experts where we try to learn medicine from a different paradigm? Okay, so I just want to give a shout out to the rest of the team who couldn't be here today. So Nige Netsband and Wifeng Sang, who are two psychologists, um, and also to the Mashana community and the shamans that we work with. Um, so thank you very much, and questions are more than welcomed. <laughs>